I'm telling you, God is here. <laughs> the lady back home would say, he's here, he's here. In other words, you ought to honor him because he's here. He is, he is here. God is already here. God is here. The choir has presented two numbers that are right in my message. So praise the Lord for the leading, guiding, and troubling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me call your attention to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. I don't know what it is, but it looks like every, every time I look at these passages, it's the same month. 2015, March 22nd, 2015. Maybe it's because God is here. And he is, he is already here. Luke chapter 10 Verses 38 through 42. For Sister Henry stood up. She said, I got that one. I got that one. I got that one. One of these days, I'm going to be, I'm going to read from one that she was out on the beach that Sunday. <laughs> and she going to be hacked. Out on the beach, running in the sand. <laughs> Vacation and all that kind of carrying on, you know. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. When you found it, you will discover these words. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him in her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But not Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are troubled. You are worried and troubled about many things. But the one thing that is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. I want to say to you, listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. I watched the video. And in the video, there was this mega church. It was a huge church. Music was playing in the room. And it was on a Saturday night. Christian music was playing in the room. In this mega huge church, there was only one man in the whole room. He was in the sanctuary. This man was sitting in a wheelchair. He wasn't listening to the music. It was just playing in the room. This man was not listening to the preacher. The preacher wasn't present. It was a Saturday evening or Saturday night. This man was in a wheelchair, and in the wheelchair, he was rolling back and forth. The reason why this man in this huge sanctuary was rolling back and forth in a wheelchair is simply because he was vacuuming the whole sanctuary. Here it is, this man in a wheelchair. He is vacuuming the sanctuary. He is vacuuming. He's listening half of the time to the music. But most of all, he was concentrating on getting the spots off the floor. This man in a wheelchair who did not put the food and left the crumbs on the floor. This man in a wheelchair that did not eat breakfast bars in the church. This man in the wheelchair that did not drop chips all over the church. He was in a wheelchair and he was rolling backwards and forward because he had a, a vacuum cleaner in his hand and he was pushing the vacuum cleaner over this huge sanctuary. He was vacuuming the floor all by himself. This man in a wheelchair, this man in a wheelchair who did not 
spill breakfast on the floor. This man in the wheelchair who, who showed up on a Saturday on his rest day. This man in a wheelchair was listening sometime to the music, but he was more concerned about what was happening on the floor, and he was moving back and forward in the wheelchair, going down every aisle in the wheelchair. He was vacuuming up the sanctuary in a wheelchair, and he was by himself in this huge sanctuary vacuuming the floor. Let me just share with you today this man wouldn't vacuum the floor just because he showed up to work, but because he had worship before he showed up. Let me tell you, with that kind of dedication, with that kind of motivation, this man did not focus his time on working. He was just working at the time. He had most of his time focused on worship. He understood, he understood that the sanctuary needed to be cleaned before the morning. He understood that, that people could not come in and sit comfortably stepping all over trash. He, he understood that if somebody's going to do it, he was going to do it. And it's not because he was so healthy that he was working, because he was in a wheelchair. It wasn't because he dropped it on the floor the reason why he was working. Because he knew that the sanctuary was holy to God and he wasn't going to drop stuff on the floor. But this man in a wheelchair was rolling backwards and forward. Looked like some 5,000 seats. He was, he was rolling the wheelchair up and down the floor. Throughout the aisle in between the rows, he was cleaning up the church. It looks like he was concerned mostly about work. But it wasn't the work that he was mostly concerned about. He was mostly concerned about worship. When we look at the text, we find Jesus meeting at Martha's house with Martha and her sister Mary. It is said that this sister Mary and Martha, both sisters were the sisters of Lazarus that had died. It is said that Jesus raised Lazarus back from the dead. When we move to the next chapter, we will find out Jesus really, really, really loved Lazarus. And he also loved Mary and Martha. And when we look at the text, we will find out that Mary decided to sit down with Jesus. The text says he, she decided to sit with Jesus and she began to listen to him. My first point this morning is that, that we must worship. We must spend some time alone by ourselves with Jesus. It's good that you come to church. It's good that you listen and watch online. But you need a quiet place that you can spend time with Jesus. Look at the text. The text says, the text says we ought to worship in verses uh, 38 and 39. It said, there it happened when they entered a certain village. This village is believed to be Bethany. Just east, just outside of Jerusalem is where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. They came to this village, Jesus and his disciples came to this village, and a certain woman, meaning that it could have been anyone, could have been every woman, could have been any man, welcomed Jesus to her house. I'm saying to you this morning, the first thing is that, that you ought to worship, and if you're going to worship, you need to welcome Jesus. I'm telling you this morning that if you're going to be all that God has called you to be, you need to find yourself worshiping Jesus. The Bible says that she invited him to her house. She welcomed him to her house. So he showed up and Mary began to worship. Let me tell you, you got to spend some time alone with God. Spend some time set aside with Jesus. Spend some time away from the hustle and bustle of life. To spend some time alone with Jesus. Because when you worship him, you get to know his heart. This man that was, that was vacuuming the floor, it's not because he was just there to do work. He was there because he had worship. Because when you worship, you begin to look at church a different way. When you worship, you begin to look at auxiliaries a different way. When you worship, you begin to look at ministry a different way. Because you understand that it's not about the new beginning church when we worship. It's about the kingdom of God. That's why we worship. 
well, well, we would really, we would really love, we would really love for every seat in the room to be packed. We would love for it to be standing room only in this church. We would love for it to be bursting out the seam every single day. But the fact of the matter is, we have to join in with those who showed up this morning. And because we showed up at the place of worship, we ought to worship. We ought to worship. We ought to worship. I would not if I was you. Get up out of my bed to watch online. Get up out of my bed to, to make my way to the church. Get up out of my bed to listen to a preacher that is limited in his speech and limited in his delivery. I would not get up out of my bed to come to church and miss worship. Let me tell you, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And some of you all paying $3 a gallon for gas. I would not spend my gas money to show up at the building if I wasn't coming to worship. Come to see Jesus. <laughs> I come to see Jesus. The, the Bible says that when the disciples were walking in the, book, book, in the book of Acts, they were walking and they were sharing Jesus Christ and People were getting healed. Even their critics says, I can look at these men and tell them that they tell that they are not learned. They haven't been to school. They are not seminarians. But one thing I know, they have been with Jesus. Can they tell? Can they tell that you've been with Jesus? When folk look at you, can they tell that you've been worshiping Jesus? When can they tell that you've been spending time alone with Jesus? When the text says that Mary was sitting and she was listening to Jesus, she was worshiping him. This word worship means to aim your attention. This word worship means to, to point your attention toward God. This word worship means to adore him. This word worship means to edify the body of Christ through the one that you glorify. This word worship means to, to lift Jesus up. And when you lift him up, you worship him. You can't hold your seat when you worship him. You cannot hold your peace when you worship him. You cannot refuse to clap when you worship him. You can tell when you've been alone with the Lord because when somebody says something or does something that reminds you of Jesus, you ought to lose your makeup on Sunday morning. Mary. Mary was at, at the house. Jesus came by the house. And when Jesus showed up, Mary sat down, and she began to worship Jesus. Do you have a war room? Do you have a quiet place where you spend your quiet time alone with God? And every couple ought to have some quiet time together, but there ought to be a time in your day and a time in your week that you get alone by yourself without your spouse, without your children, without your parents, and spend time alone with God. Because when we worship, God does some things in us that we can't do in ourselves. Grouchy people didn't worship. Stubborn people don't worship. People that lie on folk, they don't spend time in worship. Because when you spend time in worship, you're able to not only see things different, but you respond to things differently. The second point I see, I see in the text. Martha is willing to work. My second point is will. God wants your will to line up with his will. You know, oftentimes we do a lot of stuff. We do a lot of moving around. It reminds me of a guy at the chemical plant. One time, you know, we, we, we were looking and, and we noticed that every time the plant manager came by, he got outside and he got busy. The same joker that was sitting and watching videos. The same joker that was watching videos that was not company videos. Whenever the plant manager came by, he went outside and got a water hose. Began to wash down. He began to climb steeples and he began to climb columns and began to act like he working. And, and it's, it looked like he was working, but what he was doing is showing off in front of the plant manager. 
Let me tell you, God doesn't want your show. God, God doesn't want you to, to, to show face. God doesn't want you to, to worship him when you see fit and when you're trying to impress other people. Let me just tell you, don't impress me because I'm not impressed. I've been around folk almost 61 years, and I know when they faking it and they, till they make it. So God wants your will. He wants your will. Mary was sitting and she was worshiping Jesus, and God was able to deal with her will. You know, one of the worst things a person can say is that you just got to accept me for who I am. That says to me that they're going to do it their way anytime they want to do it, anyhow they want to do it, to whom they choose to do it. And regardless of what God says, God is not going to change my mind. It's those people that say, I'm going to forgive, but I'm not forgetting. Now, when you forgive, when you forgive, God has your will. And when you forgive, it doesn't mean that you've forgotten it, but it means your attitude toward it is different. It, it means that, that it doesn't hurt you like it used to hurt you. It means that it doesn't stab you like it used to stab you. It means that you don't have these visions in your head of what you ought to do to them anymore. It's because you are able to forgive and move on. Now, let me just share with you now. Now, let me just share with you. Just because I forgave you doesn't mean that you're going to get me like that again. I'm, I'm just here to tell you, I'm just here to tell you, just because I have forgiven you, Sister Brown, yeah, my psychological makeup has called it to my attention. But when you show up, when you show up, I'm not as hurt as I used to be. I've forgiven you for it. I'm walking away. I, I'm leaving it alone. I'm, I'm le you're talking about laying it at Jesus' feet. God wants us to lay our will at Jesus' feet. And when we lay our will at Jesus' feet, Jesus is able to deal with us. He's able to mold us. He's able to reconstruct us. Anybody in the audience need to be reconstructed this morning? Do your mind, does your mindset need to be changed? Do the way you feel about folk need to be turned over? Now, let me just share with you. Just because you forgive them, make sure you do. Make sure you do. Make sure you do handle things well after you forgive them. That's why Jesus says when you pray, you pray, Lord, let your will be done and not my will. Lord, do what you do and don't do what I do. God, have it your way in my life, Lord. I know what I want, and I'm going to lay it at your feet, God, but not my will, your will be done. The next point to you today is work. <laughs> verse number 40, verse number 40, verse number 40, we find that Martha is doing some work. Martha is doing some work. Now, we don't discount work because I just believe every boy that is living in a house that's over the age of of, of five ought to be out there learning how to push the lawnmower. He may not be able to make the whole, the whole thing done. He may not be able to cut the whole yard, but he ought to be out there learning how to push the mower. The late pastor E.K. Bailey says it like this. He says, he says, one day the daddy told the boy to go outside and mow the yard. The boy was seven years old. He told the boy to go outside and mow the yard. Well, the mama chimed in and she said, well, he's not strong enough to mow the yard. Uh, Pastor E.K. Bailey says it like this. He says, see, mamas know that he ought to be strong to mow the yard. But daddies know he has to mow the yard in order to get strong. <laughs> you, see, you see, every boy ought to have a strong tendency in him. Every boy ought to be able to do some things that girls can't do. Because when I grew up, boys were snakes, snails, and puppy dog tails. Girls were sugar, spice, and everything nice. But now we have switched this thing from the 20th century to the 21st century. Now boys are sweet. Boys are sugar. Boys are spice. Boys are everything nice. We need men who will surround little boys and make sure they show up as men. They have to learn how to work. Too many girls, too many girls, too many girls buying their cars, getting their degrees, and then they hanging out with somebody who don't know how to work. He doesn't have to have a degree, but he ought to know how to work. 
He doesn't, he doesn't have to be able to matriculate through all of the, the facilities and the academia that you've gone through, but he needs to know how to work. I got a call one night from a 21-year-old. Brother Irvin, he was 21 years old. By 11.30 that night, he been out. He called me. He said, hey, man, I had a flat. I said, where are we going with this conversation? I got church in the morning. I got a flat. He's 21 years old. Man, I got a flat. I said, okay. He said, well, I need you to come. And I got up out of my bed for a 21-year-old, Sister God. Went on the side of the road where he was. Rolled the jack up under the car. And said to him, this is how you do this. You let it up just piece away. Just a little bit, and then you unloose all the nuts. And after you get all the nuts unloosed, Brother Carter, then you, you let it all the way up. And when you let it all the way up, you unloose all the butt, took all the butts, the boats off, all the nuts off. And once you get it off, then you pull the tie off. Then you go in the trunk where they got it hid, right up under here. You go in the trunk and you pull the tie out. And I had to explain every single word to him. And then when you get that tie, while you still got the car elevated, then you push the tie on, Brixie. And once you put it on, then you loosen the nuts in a star pattern. You don't go all the way around and, and tight, you tighten the nuts in a star pattern. You go all the way around and you, you don't do it that way. You, you tighten one here, one here, one here, one here, until they seize the whole tie next to the car. And you still don't tighten them like that. You go right here and you tighten this one. Then you tighten this one. You do it in a star pattern. Brother Johnson, I had to go through the whole thing. 21 years old at 11.30 at night on the side of a Houston road. I had to put together a workshop on the side of the road because men are not teaching boys how to work. And women won't let boys work. We have to get to a point where we understand that work is important. And because work is important, it will save boys in the future. It will make a difference to their lives in the future. It's a shame we have people that are sitting around with good minds, healthy backs, strong hands, and have no job. When every time I drive down the road, I see help wanted. And then they have the nerve, the audacity, the gall to say, I don't want to work there. Well, the problem is, for the last five years, you haven't worked anywhere. So I have to go to work so I can pay for you to live. You'll get that one when you get to the house. I have to make sure I work, because there's a guy that's taking money out my check that's called FICA. I haven't met him, but he takes like 15% every time. There, there's another guy that's called Medicare, and every time I get a paycheck, Every time I get a paycheck, Medicare takes some more stuff. So I have to work so you don't have to work. Then there's a guy called Social Insecurity that's being threatened right now that my great-grandparents work for and my grandparents work for. Big Daddy and Big Mama work so, so I can have it. But now I got to share it with somebody that don't work. M Martha was a working woman. Martha was one that she was wiping up, she was cleaning up, she was preparing the meal because a special guest has stopped by. Let me tell you, we can't discount work. We, we need to lift up work. We need to make sure that work is on our agenda. You see, work is, is, uh, is forced time distance. That, what that means is you can do all the pushing you want to. If it doesn't move, it's not work. I can lean against this wall, and once I lean against the wall, I can lean against the wall until sweat drops from my bra. But if the wall never moves, <laughs> I have done no work. We need to get the message out today to young people that you got to make some things move. <laughs> And while you're making things move, you got to make right decisions. You have to make positive decisions. You have to make decisions that will make life better for you in the future. 
We have people, even old people, making decisions that, that's killing their lives, killing their families, and making sure that they have no future. We have to prepare now for us to be able to sit down later. If you don't prepare now, you can't sit down later. If you don't prepare now, you'll be begging the rest of your life. If you don't work now and you get off this stuff about these quick, rich schemes... There are no get-rich-quick schemes. What happens is they take all your little money that you have thinking that you're going to get rich quick. And because you're not getting rich quick, then you take another gamble and another gamble. I came to tell you that work is no gamble. Every person needs to work. Every boy. Sister Davis told me if you had a boy, you'd be able to run him off by now. We got parents now. We got parents now that say, I don't want my children to grow up the way I did. Well, you turned out all right. And since you turned out all right, it's all right for them to grow up the way you did. We, we have children that are entitled. They, they'll tell you in a, bit, in a minute, I ain't got to pay you for nothing. You my parents. And then they try to throw this guilt trip on you. You don't have that in your house, do you, Sister Carter? They try to, try to put this guilt trip on you. Well, I didn't ask to be here. Well, since you're here, you're going to work. <laughs> since, since God got you to a point in your life where you can talk big and bad, if you can talk big and bad, you can work good and bad. Everybody has to work. My, my friends used to come, and at that time, you could let children spend the night because there wasn't so much tragedy going on. And, and my friends would come over, and, and they would spend the night, and then they're going to think they're going to lay down at our house like they laid down at everybody else's house. Daddy didn't even open the door. He would say, everything in this house is going to move at 530. He said, everything got feet going to work. Everything with feet going to walk. Everything with feet going to get out of here. And then when we were young, we had to go to the field and chop cotton. And to chop, to chop cotton, you got to be on the road at 3 a.m. At 3 a.m., we were called the field folk. The field folk had to be standing on the side of the road at 3 a.m. None of us were like these boys these days still trying to wipe their eyes. No, you wasn't wiping eyes. You had your lunch, you're standing on the side of the road, you waiting on a field truck to show up, and they pack you all in there like sardines. There's no sitting on the way to the field. We were stacked in there, and then guys tried to, tried to date girls in the field with all that dust and, and all the parasite. They trying to date in the field. You didn't show up to date. You showed up to work. And guess what? We were. I remember one time I went to the field. I went to the field, Sister Pass, I went to the field, and the man fired me for chopping cotton. It's a terrible day when you get fired chopping cotton. It's a terrible time when you get fired chopping. It's the lowest of the totem pole other than feeding the hogs. Chopping cotton, the man told me, don't you come back out here tomorrow. I went home and I told mama, you know, I tell mama first so, so, I can, so she can soften the blow. I told mama, I said, mama, he told me don't come back anymore. And before mama can say, don't worry about it, she got out, don't, before she could say, don't worry about it, daddy said, you getting out of here. I said, but daddy, he doesn't want me on, our, on his truck. He said, you're going to get on this truck in the morning, and I'm not going to persuade him, you're going to be on that truck. Next morning, I'm standing on the side of the road with my little sandwich, and I'm catching this man's truck. He didn't know I was on the truck until we unloaded at the field. I'm 30 miles from home. You can't run me back now. And I had to chop cotton and, and, and prove myself. And when you chop cotton for you city folk, you don't chop the cotton down. You chop the grass out from under the cotton. And out from around the cotton. And daddy said, you're going to be on this bus. You're going to be on this truck in the morning. So guess what? I got right in there with my brothers. We crowded in there. And everybody, you know, folk have a, have a tendency today to, to joke about the job you have in the 21st century. We couldn't joke about the job we had because everybody had the same job. 
the pretty little girls with the nails, they didn't get their nails done until Saturday, and they only last two days because they got to hit the field truck in the morning. <laughs> work. We got to teach them to work. We got, Mary and Martha understood work. And Martha thought that she had to do work even in the presence of Jesus. And so we ought to work. So we don't, we don't frown on working. We ought to work. Jesus, Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus says that Mary is done doing the better thing. Look at verses number 38 through 41. We find that Jesus is talking. And when Jesus is talking, he's talking to Martha. Martha says, look, Jesus, I'm doing all this work. And Mary is doing nothing. Have you ever heard that statement? Snitches get stitches. Martha says, I am working, and Mary is doing nothing. Then she asks Jesus, Jesus, tell her to get up. Tell her to help me. Tell her to be a part of what I'm doing. Because after all, Jesus, I'm preparing for you. Let me tell you, you have to prioritize some things sometimes. Work is always good, but when it comes to worship, you need to make sure you worship. You ought to make sure that your will is turned over to Jesus. And then you can do some work. My next point is, my fourth point is, you need to wait and not worry. You need to wait. You need to wait and not worry. You need to wait. There is too much worrying going on about what tomorrow may bring. The Bible says, don't worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow got some problems that's coming that's going to slap you in the face. The, the Bible teaches don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow got some problems in his own self. He said don't worry about tomorrow because you need to just sit and wait on what God is doing. How many of you know God is doing some things? He's working behind the scene. God is at work all around us. And since God is at work all around us, we got to just sit and wait. Have you ever got to a thing, to a point in your life where you didn't have to do nothing but wait? One day, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to be at my destination. And I had booked my plane flight. And the flight got delayed. I wanted to be on the ground at my destination in a couple hours. But the plane been delayed two hours in itself. There's no way for me to make it where I wanted to be on time. And guess what? I couldn't get out there and run there. I had no car to drive there. I had no position to get out there and, and thumb a ride there. Only thing I could do is wait. And let me tell you, there's something about waiting when you're waiting. See, Mary is waiting. Mary is listening to Jesus. She's waiting. The only thing about waiting is you have confidence that your wait won't be in vain. When you have confidence that your wait is not in vain, you can wait with a good attitude. I mean, there are people, there are people that's, that's fighting it, and there are people that are talking about it. This one guy behind us, they should have made sure that that wheel was locked down before we got on the plane. It's their responsibility. I'm looking at him. All you can do is wait. All you can do is wait. All you have to do is wait. And when, when they found out what the problem was, when one of the, the ground crews saw something about the size of a quarter fall out from under the wheel, he notified the cockpit. The cockpit was the, it had the pilot in there, and the pilot said, I'm, drown, I'm grounding the plane. He didn't just ground the plane because he made a decision. He grounded the plane because there's a man in the air, and the man in the air said, you ain't going nowhere. So the pilot had to wait. The attendants had to wait. The passengers had to wait. And when they found out, what had happened, the brakes on the plane had been sheared in pieces and that little quarter that had fallen out, that little piece the size of a quarter that had fallen out from under the plane was part of the brake element that had fallen out on the plane. By the time we had fallen down in Baltimore, Maryland, then that we would have had no brakes on the plane. I thank God there is power, there is strength, there is help, and there is hope in the midst of waiting. I call it God's amazing grace. If we had not waited, if the pilot had been impatient, 
If the man in the sky had not ground the plane, when we hit Baltimore, Maryland, my little girl and I would have been dead on arrival. But thank God we were willing to wait. I heard all these complaints. Even after they found out what the problem was, people still complaining. Let me tell you, some folk going to complain regardless of what happened. Some people can, as the songwriter said, they are complaining with a loaf of bread under their arm. And, and no one else has bread, but they're complaining. Let me tell you, count your blessings. Name them one by one. And watch what God can do. You ought to worship. You ought to turn your will over to God. You ought to work for God. And you have to wait on God. My next point is you must witness. Verse 142. Matter of fact, verses 38 through 42. Mary has become a witness to all of us in this room. Mary has become a witness that it's good to worship the Almighty God. Let me tell you that the trouble that you've been having, that you've been dealing with all your life, that trouble you've been dealing with for the last two weeks, the trouble you've been dealing with for the last three months, the trouble you've been get, dealing with for the last five years, all you had to do is worship. All you got to do is wait. All you have to do is work. All you have to do is turn your will over to God. And when you turn your will over to God, then you can be a witness. Jesus says, go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing those who will believe in Jesus. Go ye therefore into all the world, making disciples, baptizing disciples. Go ye therefore and be a witness. He says, Acts 1 and 8 declares that if you be a witness, in order to be a witness, once the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you will be a witness. You will be a witness in Jerusalem. You will be a witness in Judea. You will be a witness in Samaria and to the utmost parts of the world. The question today, are you a witness? Are you living it up for the Lord? Are you being blessed of Lord? Have you sat and listened to the Lord? I mean, we're doing Bible listening. We're doing Bible study. We're doing, we're doing Bible reading. And we want to hear what God has to say. We already know what they say. We already know what Trump's saying. We already know what's going to come out of his mouth. We already know what CNN has to say. We know what ABC, NBC has to say. It's just the same old stuff being regenerated over and over and over again. We need to hear from Jesus. We need to hear what God has to say. And we can find it in his word. And when we find it in his word, oh yeah, we can worship. We are set free. The Bible says that who, he who God sets free is free indeed. You're looking for some freedom, freedom from alcoholism, freedom from drugs, freedom from prostitution, freedom from, from homosexuality, freedom from any activity that you can find yourself in, freedom from stealing, freedom from lying. I mean, we growing up a, a nation of children that can lie at the drop of the hat. You can ask them a simple question, and they'll tell you a lie just looking at you, just make, and they quick with it. And you're still trying to figure out, they left you way down the road. You're still trying to figure out, why did you even tell that lie? I mean, what is that, that lie even worth? But when you worship Jesus, and when they see you worshiping him, when they see you listening to him, you set forth an example before them. You are a witness to them. And regardless of how they feel about you now, they will call you old fogey. They will call you a holy roller. They will call you a Bible thumper. But guess what? When they get in trouble, guess who they're going to call on? They may not come by to visit you on a regular basis, but when they get in trouble, they're going to call. They ain't not going to call 911. They're going to call the one who can get a, a question through to God, one who can get a prayer through to God, one who can call on God, and God will get an answer to them. They're going to call you, but you got to be a witness. And the only way to be a witness is that, first of all, you worship. Spend quality time with God. The church who's a praying church is a church that is a thriving church. 
A church that's a praying church is a church that is a victorious church. A church that is a studying church is a church that God visits on a regular basis. And he, he reveals himself in the midst of our troubles. I just stopped by to say my little speech to tell you today, you got to listen to Jesus. Don't listen to X. Don't listen to the presidential candidates. Whatever you do, forget about listening to the governor and the superintendent. <laughs> Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Welcome him into your home. Worship him. Bless his name. Lift him and don't be ashamed. Don't be shy. Lift his name. I don't care if you're in the supermarket and the spirit of the Lord unctions you and blesses you. Some folk get blessed and won't even thank the Lord publicly. Oh, I bless his name. God, I thank you. I mean, I'm looking for a reason. Just bless me one time. Just let one thing go my way. Just drop my bill down by two cents and I'm already blessing him. I'm going to worship him right in the presence of him. And if you don't realize, you don't realize that sooner or later, when you become a witness for the Lord, it will catch on fire. It will become contagious and other folk will worship him. They won't look down at you. They will look up at your God that you serve. That's why he says we are the light of the world. And you don't put a light on a candlestick and hide it and blind it. You put it on top of a mountaintop where everybody can see it. Why the, senior, the senior saints back home, when the deacons bowed down to pray, they would say, Lord, I come for no outside shape, form, or fashion. I come not for any outside show. I come with my face bent down toward the mother's dust. Thanking you again for who you are and what you have done. Those folk know how to honor God. They knew how to praise him. And they said, Lord, I thank you for waking me up this morning. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that the bed I slept in was not my cooling board. Lord, I thank you that the sheet I rolled up in was not my winding sheet. Lord, I thank you that I'm on top of the ground and the ground's not on top of me. Lord, I thank you for another chance to lift your name, to praise you and honor you. Lord, I thank you that when I went from room to room, my family is doing fine. Lord, I thank you for blessing me one more time. You got to know how to worship. And when you worship, you got to give him your will. And when you worship and give him your will, you got to know when to work and how to work. And you need to know when to wait. God may not come when you want him, but he show sure his own time. We need to wait on him sometime because they that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. The young may fall. The young may give out. But they that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And because I'm still living, because I still have breath in my body, I want to serve the Lord the balance of my days. I want to be a witness unto him. I want to leave a legacy unto him. And when I leave a legacy unto him, young folk can say, there he was, and he was a blessing to me. My wife can say, there he was. My children can say, he was a blessing to me. And God will say, servant, well done. <laughs> my good and faithful servant. But in order for God to say well done, you have to do well. Take care of your business down here so God can take care of your business over here. The door of the church is open. The same Jesus that worked for us, the same Jesus she worshiped, the same Jesus that we walked in his will, the same Jesus was a witness. Over 2,000 years ago, they lifted him high. They nailed him tight. They dropped him low. He died on Calvary. Yes, he did. He died between two things. He gave up the ghost just for you and just for me. That same Jesus, they took him off the cross. They laid him in a bar of tomb. It was a cave. It was a bar of tomb. They, they laid him in a bar of tomb. But early that third day morning, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. I want to tell you today, if your enemies think you are down, they believe they put you away. And people will make fun of you as you wait on God. But they that wait on him, God is able to elevate them. They that wait on him, God is able to move in their lives. They that wait on the Lord, God will give you favor. He will give you honor. 
He will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. And where your enemies will say, ooh we, I want to serve the God that he served. He's the God of power. He's the God of peace. And he's the God of prosperity. His name is Jesus. If you're here today, if you're listening today, and you've not been worshiping God, you got to be. You must be. You have to be born again. Now, being born again, it's not running, jumping, shouting, rolling in the floor. These things you may do, that's left up to you and the Holy Spirit. But what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. He bought us back. And he brought us back. You have to let your will go. And follow the will of Jesus. He can do more with your business than you can do with your business. He can do more with your money than he can do, you can do with your money. He can do more at your house than you can do in your house. He can do more with your finances than you can do with your finances. He can do more with your health than you can do with your health. We have to worship him. The door is open. Will you come to Jesus? Just as you are. Don't wait till you get it right. You'll never get it right. You need to come to Jesus and let him get it right. Trust him. Are there any present who've never confessed Jesus as your Savior? This is your moment to listen to Jesus. Will you come?